This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello, and welcome or welcome back to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist. I've lived and worked in Fayetteville, Arkansas for now almost 30 years. And I started Self Work six years ago to basically extend the walls of my practice. I wanted to spread the word about what therapy really was. I know some of you are already very interested in psychological, emotional issues. Maybe you are in therapy yourself, but some of you may have just been diagnosed with something or you're looking for some other kinds of answers. But I also know that there's a third group of you. Some of you may have started listening to self-work today in order to just see, well, what's this like? You know, what's a therapist like? What's a psychologist like? What is she going to say? So you're also looking for answers, but you're a little more skeptical, and that's okay. Welcome to all of you. Before we begin talking about the topic of the day, I want to tell you about a great new sponsor's product, Ozark Mountain Medicine's CBD Salve and Tincture. So let's hear their fantastic offer for self-work listeners. Diagnosed with degenerative disc in my back when I was in my 20s, I've long been a seeker of alternative ways to help reduce inflammation, and I can't believe that the best product I've ever found is produced here in Northwest Arkansas. Ozark Mountain Medicine, located on a small boutique farm in the Ozark Mountains under the careful watch of CBD guru Bill Morgan, is a grassroots operation which produces some of the highest quality CBD available on the market. Unlike marijuana, which contains THC, which is what makes it mood-altering, CBD isn't the same and is legal in all states. Ozark Mountain Medicine's products contain at least 16 varieties of hemp, where other CBD products may use only one. Think of it as a healing gumbo for your joint and muscle aches, and you've got the picture. What's most important to me and to you is that it works. I've been told at least three times in my life that I needed to be reassessed for back surgery, and three times I've kept walking, getting massages, and for the last three years, steadfastly using this product. You can take it orally in tincture form, or calming salves are available, which is what I prefer. The other benefits of taking it include immune support, increased relaxation, reduced anxiety, and improved sleep. So here's their fabulous offer for self-work listeners. All you have to do is use this promo link, ozarkmountainmedicine.com slash self-work, and you'll receive 10% off your order. I never suggest a product to you that I haven't used myself, and I reap this one's benefits each and every day. That code again is ozarkmountainmedicine.com slash self-work. Sometimes the best solutions are right under your nose. So try a bit of Ozark Mountain Medicine CBD and see for yourself. I've had many people tell me over the years that they feel free to tell me things in therapy because they know I can't tell anyone else. That's true, of course, unless I believe there is imminent danger of some kind to them or someone else. But I don't think of my role as that of secret keeper. Instead, I think of a therapist as offering safety rather than secrecy. Part of the safety is the secrecy, but of course, in abusive or manipulative relationships, secrecy is often used with malintent. So today, we're going to talk about secrets. And just to give you a heads up, this is what author Michael Slepian has to say about his parents keeping the secret that he wasn't his father's biological child. He says, Learning that I wasn't biologically related to my father was shocking, but it also made me think about what it was like for my parents to keep that secret. Years later, when I was writing this book, I asked them what it was like. Their experience aligned with what I was learning about in my own research, that even a secret that never comes up in conversation can be burdensome. Hiding secrets is the easy part. The hard part is everything else. The hard part is having to think about this thing and not share it with others. And I'm going to have the link to his fairly new book in the show notes. And speaking of secrets, the speak pipe voicemail for today is from a woman who revealed childhood sexual abuse to her sister, and her abuser was a brother, eight years older than she. Sadly, the sister has withdrawn from her, and now she's asking me what she should do. So what would you say? As always, thank you so much for being here. We're on the cusp of 300 episodes and the actual sixth anniversary of self-work. I cannot believe it. I owe it to all of you. We'll talk more about that 
next time on the 300th episode. But right now, we've got 299. Secret keeping. It's what children say when you ask them what makes a friend. I can tell them a secret. It's something we know that will bring great joy, but it's not quite time yet to reveal the secret. So it's a temporary secret. Secrets can sometimes be the glue that holds a group together, a secret handshake or ritual of some kind. Secrets are kept because the judgment is made that the truth would be too hurtful. And those secrets sometimes backfire, but the intention is good. It's obvious when the intent is not good that there's a problem. So today on Self Work, let's look for the answers to these questions. What are the most common secrets? Why can some people not keep a secret or why are they a tattletale or a gossip? What's the difference between secrecy and privacy or secrecy and confidentiality? Is it true that when something is kept secret from you, it has no impact on you? And what's the difference between secrecy and manipulation or even abuse? So, first question, what are the most common secrets that we keep? Again, our author Michael Slepian says, Among more than 50,000 research participants, the most common secrets include a lie we've told at 69%, romantic desire at 61%, sex at 58%, and finances 58%. No real surprises there, I don't think. It was interesting what Slepian had to say about the lie that's hardest to keep. That lie is the one you think about all the time. It's the, if anyone knew this, kind of lie. Or perhaps a lie that goes back years and years, when someone is building a phantom life to present to you, or you're doing it yourself. I saw a couple once where the wife was getting to know some of her husband's old friends and casually mentioning what he told her about himself to them. Like he said he was on a traveling baseball team that had won a bunch of games. But she found out he wasn't on the team and he had played baseball, but poorly. So what was it about that lie that made it so important to tell? There were others and they did divorce. Not because, sadly, she couldn't have had compassion for him. In fact, she wanted to understand they had kids and she wanted to keep their family together. But he resolutely denied that the baseball story and other things she discovered were lies. This is when we get into the subject of compulsive lying, and he may fit that bill. Compulsive lying is when you lie out of habit, not necessarily with malintent. You just skirt the truth. You just have the habit to not tell the truth. It's different from pathological lying, and that's when you lie to manipulate. But you can see that trust still can be a problem in either one of these kinds of lying, especially if someone doesn't recognize the impact of that habit. So the second question, why can some people not keep a secret or even be a tattletale or a gossip? I'm sure that you know people when you meet them, someone who knows them well will say, "Mm, she's a really nice person or he's a great guy, but don't tell them anything you don't want anyone else to know. (laughs) They're just not good at keeping secrets. Now, I definitely tattled on my brothers all the time as a child, especially my oldest brother. To say he and I didn't get along as children is somewhat of an oversimplification. That changed drastically, I'm happy to say. But when I found a cigar in a drawer in his bedroom, oh my goodness, I couldn't wait to tell. I was a tattletale. But it seems that keeping a secret actually is hard on you physically. Our resident expert for this episode, Michael Slepian again, says, The more a person's mind wanders to their secret, the harder it is not having emotional support or advice. When we're alone with something important, especially something harmful or bothersome, we tend not to develop the healthiest ways of thinking about it. And the more meaningful or bigger the secret is, it's connected with doing less well on tasks. When you write a secret down in a journal, interestingly enough, your immune system starts functioning better. So secrets are hard to keep on us physically, and maybe there's some people that it's just literally really, really hard physically for them to do so. But I've long believed that gossips, people that seem to be compelled to focus on other people's lives, often in an unkind or non-compassionate way, have a need to take you down a notch because of their own insecurity, because of something you seem to possess that they don't, because they feel power when they share something. A very recent example of that is from the show Bridgerton and the story of the birth or the emergence of Lady Whistledown, 
and her newsletter, whose gossip is not untrue, but is definitely the way this character achieves a sense of importance. She feels invisible, so she wants people to know, and she wants to know herself, that she is very powerful. Before we go on, let's stop for a minute and hear from AG1 or Athletic Greens. When I told my doctor what supplements I took the other day, she said, oh yeah, I've been hearing about them. They're really good. So here's Athletic Greens offer for self-work listeners. Our partner, AG1, has a product I use every day. I started taking Athletic Greens, frankly, because they were interested in sponsoring self-work, and I never recommend something to you without trying it first. With one scoop of AG1, whose taste is somewhere between sweet and tart to me, you'll get 75 high-quality minerals, vitamins, probiotics, adaptogens, and whole food source superfoods, which support everything from your gut to your immune system to your energy level. I love it because whether I'm home and about to go out for a walk or traveling and about to spend time with friends and family, I can start my day proactively, knowing I'm doing something for my own self-care. If you're like me, self-care can get lost for sure. In fact, Its founder, after having severe gut issues, realized he was taking over $100 a day worth of supplements, which had their own very complicated dosage routine, so he created Athletic Greens. To make it easy, and because you're a self-work listener, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is to visit athleticgreens.com slash self-work. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash self-work to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. So, third topic. What's the difference between secrecy and privacy or secrecy and confidentiality? First, we'll take secrecy and privacy. Again, here's Dr. Slepian's view. There are all kinds of things we don't discuss that are not secrets. For many people, it's their sex lives. The details may not be anything they're necessarily keeping secret. They just have this idea that this is not the sort of thing we talk about. But if I was asked a question related to it by someone close to me, I would probably answer the question. If you wouldn't answer the question, if the intention is to hold the information back, even if it ever comes up, then it qualifies as a secret. I like to think of it like a privacy fence, the difference between secrecy and privacy. Maybe you like to swim in the nude, so privacy is about intimacy for you. Or you just don't want your neighbors or passers-by to be able to see what you're up to on a Sunday afternoon because your activities are private. It's a private party or a gathering. It's not public. It's a boundary. But if someone popped by, you wouldn't have people hide, (laughs) at least not for the party. Maybe (laughs) Maybe if you were swimming in the nude, you would. But it's not secret. So there's a big distinction there. One of the harder things about reaching some kind of celebrity status is that somehow people want to know about your private life. They don't want there to be a boundary. And the more celebrated you are, the more people want to know. We talked about that in episode 288, The Cost of Fame, as told by Tim Ferriss, the celebrated podcaster and writer. So what about secrecy and confidentiality? What's the difference there, or is there one? In the intro, I talked about not feeling like a secret keeper as a therapist, but as a safety keeper. I may know or be told things that my client hasn't divulged to others, but I think the power of the therapeutic relationship is different than maybe a friend who also knows the secret, because as a therapist, I have no attachment to the secret, and a friend might, so that would make it harder to keep for that friend. Let's say you told your friend you were having an affair, but the friend sees your partner all the time. A therapist won't. So it's cleaner, simpler, and obviously for me, a plus for therapy. Because as they love to say in Alcoholics Anonymous, you're only as sick as the secrets you keep. Let me say that again because I believe it. You're only as sick as the secrets you keep. In the research literature, there also seems to be a distinction between them, confidentiality and secrecy. Confidentiality is when someone might be aware that there's a secret they don't have access to, whereas actual secrecy means they don't know anything about it. I tried to translate this into real life because I do see its meaning. Let's say if I know you're keeping a secret confidential, then I may know something about it, but I don't have access. I just know there's something about it that's confidential. 
but I could also be completely unaware that there's something I don't know. Think of this in light of relationships, because it could be an important distinction. If you found out your partner was keeping this second kind of secret, something of which you were totally unaware, then that secrecy may cause you to believe that you don't even know your partner. One of the most dramatic examples of this is when one partner in a relationship finds out their other partner has a second family or some other huge secret. And believe me, this does happen. And so you have to say to yourself, how could you keep this a total secret? I don't even know you. It's likely, obviously, to be devastating for the relationship. They kept whole chunks of themselves a secret from you, rather than perhaps something you know they like to keep confidential, or you may not know quite all of the story, but it doesn't feel like a secret. It just feels like they're holding something in confidence. Now, I realize there are ways to know if someone is telling a lie, For example, there can be a change in speech patterns, the use of non-congruent gestures, meaning their gestures don't match what their speech is saying. It's when they don't say enough or they say too much. They have an unusual rise or fall in vocal tone. The direction of their eyes tends to be different. They might dart around or at least not look at you when they're telling a lie. They may cover their mouth or eyes, and there may be some excessive fidgeting. But perhaps I wouldn't be a great detective. I've caught on to lies in therapy that were being told, but not always. I think it actually becomes harder when someone believes their lie or their perception of their lie. Clinton's, I didn't have sex with that woman, is a good example. Although lying experts say that even then he exuded certain signs of lying. I'm not picking on a political party. I'm sure we could find things in another political party that has been a lie as well. But this next question is, does being lied to have no impact on you? I well remember a patient who walked in for a first session and said, if you have a problem with me having an affair, I need to leave now. It was an unusual way to begin therapy and helped me realize that he was having to defend against his own feelings of shame by projecting them onto me, or so it seemed. But he later also said, I know that it's not hurting my wife because she'll never find out. You can probably hear the narcissism here as well. A denial of the impact of his actions on others is part of that sort of personality disorder. But I disputed that with him gently. She may not know, but she's also having to cut herself off from any kind of gut reaction or emotional or mental questioning she might have, and that does damage. Because you can grow detached from that part of yourself when you convince yourself, oh, nothing's going on, I need to get a hold of myself. Secrets have power. That power can be subtle, but it can also be not so subtle. So I do think that being lied to has a destructive impact on the person who's the recipient. We've reached the last question, and that's the connection between secrecy and abuse or manipulation. So I'll repeat, secrets have power. And when you've kept a secret all your life about how you were treated by a parent or mistreated, I should say, by a pastor, by a coach or teacher, by neighborhood kids or bullies, keeping that secret has changed you. When people tell me, and believe me, many people have, that their secret or their struggle is so deeply buried that they have no idea how to allow it to begin to emerge or be expressed, I tell them that this is what I've learned. Imagine yourself at the top of a big inner tube, and you're in the inner tube, You can only face one way, and your trauma or abuse or manipulation, your memories of it, no matter how vague or detailed, are in front of you. So, you push them away. The term is compartmentalization. We do this every day in a milder form. You have a fight with your kid before school, and you say things you wish you hadn't said, or they tell you they hate you. But you've got a hard day as a teacher or a nurse, or you're going out to a construction site, so you shove it away for the time being. But the healthy thing to do is to bring it back into your consciousness when you have the time to do so, maybe that night, not too long, and you begin to work through it. You ask your child to talk with you, and both of you try to find a better emotional place with one another. That's when compartmentalization is helpful because you've attended to your tasks or your duties for the day, but you get it back out. But when you push abuse away with all your might or the memories of it, and you do that repetitively as a child or as an adult, 
What does that abuse do? And what do the emotions do? They come full circle in the inner tube. But now they're behind you where you can't see them. And they have an effect on you that you won't be able to recognize. Yes, you're keeping your hurt secret. You're keeping the things that happened and your emotional, physical, and mental memories locked away. But they're not really locked away. They're just affecting you in ways you can't see. As Terrence Reel had one of his patients say, and I don't want to talk about it, the patient said, You mean if I don't feel it, I live it? So yes, if you don't feel that hurt, that pain, that humiliation, that anger, that confusion, you'll live it out in ways you don't recognize. But when you finally do, you can say, Wow, what happened? I just needed to work through it myself. That's what gives abuse power for years after it has stopped. You keeping the secret and living that silence out gives your perpetrator continued power over you. Now, let me say this carefully as well. It's very important if you choose to work through what happened to you and even reveal it, that you do that with someone you trust. That's vital. I talked to one more person yesterday in what over the last few years has been a constant stream of people who said to me that a family member had killed themselves. What she said is she'd read and listened to everything she could find about perfectly hidden depression because this woman's suicide was very unexpected. So if you identify with needing to look in control all the time and that need began long ago, if you struggle with a voice inside that continually mocks or derides you, that voice began perhaps as someone else's voice, but then you've pushed it away so much that now it can seem like your voice. That's part of the secret You absorbed the criticism. You absorbed the shame. And now it seems as if it's your voice. But it's not. And separating that out takes courage. If you are lonely because you've never opened up to anyone about what really happened to you or what you're afraid of, then that loneliness can be devastating. So please consider it. Consider telling someone you trust. Once again, secrets have power. And that power can destroy you from the inside. Speak pipe message from drmargaretrutherford.com. Let's hear from our speak pipe listener and caller. Hi, Dr. Rutherford. As you can guess, I'm from the UK. (laughs) This is quite a taboo subject. And I have listened to some of your podcasts on sibling sexual abuse and This happened to me. My brother was eight years older than me when I was seven. And although I've had therapy for that, the problem I still have is the disclosure to my sister and the problems that it's caused. I wish I'd listened to your podcast before explaining how you should be ready to disclose your abuse to people. If I'd listened to that first, I probably wouldn't have told her. But after therapy, I was in the middle of therapy and I just told her in an email actually and she's the only one that knows and this has caused a massive barrier between us right now and I just wanted to see if there was any advice you could give me on how to approach her or whether I should just go no contact I really am at a loss to know what to do and I feel quite hurt that she's kind of just abandoned me after telling her which is obviously something I wasn't expecting so Yeah, I was just wondering what advice you could give me on this. I'd be really grateful. We've been talking about secrets and their power this entire episode. The caller mentions the episode I did on sibling abuse, and I've actually received a lot of feedback and questions from that episode. It'll be in your show notes, and it's episode 217. You can hear the pain in her voice as she talks about feeling abandoned by her sister after she risked telling her truth with her. The why of the sister not either believing her or not wanting to believe her isn't explained. Again, the listener didn't say how her sister had reacted other than to say that she'd withdrawn from her. What I believe I said in episode 217 was that you have to be prepared for the different reactions you might get, either when you confront an abuser yourself or you tell others. Because when you're prepared, perhaps you won't get hurt again. And this listener definitely has been hurt again. Her sister's withdrawal could be explained by many things. Was she abused also? 
And if so, perhaps she needed to withdraw because she's too upset. Some memories are also hers, and she needs to try to get away from them. Does her image of her family or her brother or both need to stay put where it was before her sister's revelation? Maybe she can't or won't believe that that kind of thing happened in her own family. Maybe she's very close to her brother and felt as if she needed to defend him or stay loyal to her parents, or she's just in basic denial. How many times have I heard in my office, I thought this happened to other people, but not to me, not to my family. Or maybe she believes her sister had some kind of ulterior motive for telling her and has become angry. Obviously, I don't know. But what should this listener do now? First, I'd bow to the therapist she's seeing now and their advice. They probably know some of the answers to the questions above and can guide the patient far better than I. I might suggest that she tell her sister that she'd love for her to come to therapy with her or to another therapist of the sister's choosing to try and work out whatever's going on. Or this listener could literally write a letter saying that she doesn't understand her sister's response, misses her, and would like to try to work through whatever is going on. But I'd also be quick to say that her sister is in control of half of that decision to reconcile. She's only in control of her half. And if the sister can't or won't or doesn't know how or is too upset, then this listener finding others to support her is important. I try not to judge the sister or surround herself with people who will feel dislike for her. That won't help anything and even could set up even more difficulty for some kind of resolution or further understanding. Unless this is a fairly typical response of her sister's, that maybe when there's conflict she withdraws, then waiting for a period of time may be very helpful. So in that letter you might say, I'll be waiting for your signal that you're ready to talk, but checking in from time to time. The listener admits some anger, and that's understandable, but I'm sure there are other feelings as well in her grief. I'm so sorry this has happened, but it's not all that uncommon, which of course is sad. And I want to remind her it still took a lot of courage to tell. And hopefully her sister will be able to find the courage to talk more about it. Thank you all so much for once again honoring me and my team with your presence here at Self Work. And as I said last time, oh, by the way, I need to tell you, I wasn't sick last time. My voice sounded really, really funny, I know, on 298. I just had to get up very early in the morning. My my husband had a medical procedure, and I guess I just hadn't waked up very much. I told my engineer that I sounded like Darth Vader, so he began calling me Dr. Vader. (laughs) Well, I think I'm back. We're coming up on episode 300 and also in another couple of weeks, the sixth anniversary of self-work. It'll be in mid-October. I'm just as excited about that, if not even more than the 300th episode. So there'll be a little celebration here and there, and we can join in together and just be glad we're all learning from one another. Thank you for your ratings and reviews. I always can use more of them because new listeners are looking to see who's listening to self-work. So your rating and your review helps them find out, oh yeah, this is still a very viable podcast. And of course, telling your friends and family about self-work is also the best marketing tool I could possibly ask for. Perfectly Hidden Depression is available everywhere you buy books. And I'm also available to speak to your organization's I'm developing a new website as we speak, and we're really going to be pressing me as a speaker because I just love to be in front of a live audience now. Of course, I'll do it virtually if I need to, but I would love to come speak to whatever group, small or large or medium. I just want to spread the word about perfectly hidden depression and good mental health practices in businesses. Thank you so much for being here. Again, you can join my Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. Would love to have you there. Please take care of yourself, your loved ones, and your community. We all need to offer each other kindness and compassion, even when we disagree. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self-Work.